Welcome back. You are watching Aussie Indian and uh, we are bringing you the highlights of uh, Aussie Indian 2023 year in review and uh, we are bringing you an exclusive interview with the Anti-Slavery Commissioner and New South Wales Government uh, is tackling the modern slavery head on and uh, here is part one of that interview with the Anti-Slavery Commissioner. Let's take a look. As we said before, uh, I am with uh, the Anti-Slavery Commissioner, Dr. James Cocaine. Uh, Commissioner, welcome to the program. Thank you, Raj. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. And uh, this is just a, this was started just last year, wasn't it? That's right. We're just coming up on one year that I've been in the role mm -hmm. since the 1st of August last year. And uh, the mandate started just seven months before that on the 1st of January 2022 under some legislation that was passed by the New South Wales Parliament actually back in 2018, okay. but it took a while to get up and moving. Yeah, I had a look at the website. It has got the act which was passed in 2018, legislated. Uh, it says modern slavery. What's the difference between modern slavery and the past slavery? Well, traditionally, chattel slavery was when uh, we had legal rights to own other people, uh, something that was abolished in the British Empire. Uh, formally, a couple of hundred years ago. But as the history of uh, British colonialism shows, there were many forms of exploitation that continued after that formal abolition of slavery. Mm -hmm. So today we talk about modern slavery, which involves one person treating another person as if they owned them. It's not permitted under law to formally own somebody, but people still behave, unfortunately, mm -hmm. as if they do own other people. So that can take a range of forms, and often it's done under the cover of a contract. It might be a marriage contract, it might be an employment contract. So in Australia, we think there are about 41,000 people, unfortunately, currently, who are living in modern slavery. Probably 40% of them are in forced marriage. And then the, the rest are in uh, forced labour and exploitation in a range of different industries. It might be in agriculture or in cleaning industry, in private security industry. It might be in meat packing. Uh, we hear about cases uh, in the commercial sex industry. We hear about cases in uh, nail salons. Really anywhere where there are vulnerable pa uh, populations that can be exploited by people who treat them as if they own them. Well, this looks more like a human rights issue. Uh, why is it uh, this not a part of the Human Rights Commission? Why a separate commission? Well, I exist at this, uh, my mandate's at the state level. The Human Rights Commission is a federal organization. We don't have a Human Rights Act or a Human Rights Commission here in New South Wales. So an, a dedicated role was needed to really drive this work forward. We've had modern slavery offences on the books for some time in New South Wales and nationally, uh, but it hasn't necessarily been an issue that the uh, law enforcement and social service organisations that are needed to identify and support people with lived experience, it's not necessarily something that's been at the forefront of their minds. So a big part of my role, especially as the first anti-slavery commissioner in New South Wales, is about raising awareness making sure people understand this is happening, unfortunately, around us, and that we need to uh, get better at taking preventive steps. If we're seeing someone who we think may be at risk of being exploited, perhaps they're not leaving the home and maybe they're showing signs of, uh, of abuse or, or uh, coercion in some way, we need to get better at raising those concerns with both the police, or if, if that's not some uh, not a reporting channel people are comfortable with, with, then with other relevant authorities, including my office, uh, or indeed relevant charities. Okay. So this is a state uh, organisation. Does other do other states have similar uh, commissioners? Not yet. Uh, the federal government has announced they'll be creating a federal anti-slavery commissioner role probably later this year. We don't quite know the shape of that role yet. Uh, the Australian Capital Territory, uh, Canberra, um, have considered recently the idea, uh, but it, they haven't taken a decision yet on whether to move forward with that or not. Okay. And Commissioner, what's uh, in summary, your brief, what, what are the main tasks of uh, the Commission? 
The, the central task is really to make sure that as a society and as governmental system, we get better at identifying people who've exploit, uh, been exploited in this way mm -hmm. and who need our assistance and support. And that's a more complex task than perhaps it initially sounds because there are a number of steps that need to be undertaken to achieve that result. First of all, we need to get better at identifying where these people are. Who are they? Why are they being trapped in these situations of exploitation? It's very difficult for them to come forward, usually. They, they're maybe denied physical access to reporting channels or they have uh, cultural or linguistic barriers. Uh, perhaps they're in poor health. Uh, perhaps they're simply fearing that they'll be uh, intimidated or their family members in another country will be intimidated if they come and report. So uh, nationally, we know that only about 20% of cases are reporting, perhaps even lower than that. Uh, that's information that comes from the Australian Institute of Criminology. Uh, so first, we need to get better at identifying them. Secondly, we then need to make sure that they're uh, that we are actually able to provide them the kinds of support that they need. So people who've been denied uh, participation in society in the way that someone who's suffered modern slavery has, those people are going to need a range of forms of support. They're often deeply traumatised, so they might need medical or uh, psychological assistance. Yep. They need perhaps financial support to get back on their feet. They're going to need legal advice on their, their rights uh, and how to uh, become fully engaged again in a safe way with society. Uh, they might need other forms of support as well as they navigate the system. So part of my role is to help them get to the places where they get that support, but also to keep an eye on how can we actually ensure the system makes it easier for these people to get good outcomes. So I have a part of the mandate that's really about monitoring uh, the governmental laws and policies, yep. and then speaking with government, uh, from, with, from whom I'm independent, but speaking with government, speaking with the parliament about what can be done to strengthen the system so that we have less modern slavery in the first place mm -hmm. and so that we are doing better in assisting people who do have modern slavery. And that's a, that's a step that's really worth our while because the evidence shows uh, that on the current caseload we have here in New South Wales, the cost to New South Wales uh, of modern slavery are probably somewhere between one and ten billion dollars with a B. Right. It's a significant cost where all suffering. It's not only falling on the direct victims, it's showing up in reduced wages, reduced productivity, uh, negative health outcomes that impose a burden on the healthcare system. It's it's a, a smart idea for us to invest in these preventive measures rather than bear all of those costs. Mm. Would you say that uh, most of the victims are from uh, the ethnic communities, the immigrant communities, uh, who are, uh, uh, as you said, they are not very, they don't come forward readily because of their own safety or, uh, you know, their livelihood and so on and so forth. Is, do you think that is the case in Australia? Because Australia is an advanced country, it's not a third world country, where you see the slavery in huge numbers uh, because of uh, the lack of uh, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure to identify them and bring them to the uh, uh, books. Do you think Australian, uh, these victims here in Australia mostly come from the ethnic communities? The data shows that uh, what matters is someone's vulnerability and people are vulnerable for different reasons in different contexts. So there's no doubt that in many of the contexts where we see forced labour and forced marriage, people who are vulnerable to those forms of exploitation are coming from uh, uh, culturally and linguistically diverse communities here in New South Wales. For example, uh, we have temporary migrant workers coming from overseas yes. who ha have perhaps language barriers, but certainly social barriers. They'd, they don't have the social networks here. They're newly arrived. Mm -hmm. They're new to our system. They don't know how to uh, navigate the complexities of the visa system or of Centrelink or of all of those social support services that we often take for granted in the broader system. Uh, but in other contexts, it's not really your cultural background or your migrant status that might make you vulnerable. It might be, for example, that you're a person living with a disability. Yes. And so you're working in a disability segregated workplace and your barriers to accessing those kinds of support come from not only your disability itself, 
but from the social isolation that that produces and the difficulty uh, getting the support. Well, we have heard and we have seen on uh, in the news that uh, some of these um, marriage breakdowns which happen, uh, they, uh, usually the uh, husband happens to be from, from overseas and uh, leaving uh, the woman here uh, in a desperate position, how do you track them down when they, are, they escape to some overseas destination? Mm. Uh, well, my office itself does not have an investigative or policing mandate, um, but we do receive inquiries from people who are suffering these forms uh, of destitution and, and exploitation, uh, and our obligation in that case is to help them get to the relevant authorities that can provide them that support whether it's through consular channels, through policing channels, uh, those kinds of forms of support. What I would say about the, the case that you were talking about, Raj, is uh, we do see a high number of those cases presenting in Australia, mm -hmm. um, forced marriage cases that lead uh, to exploitation. Uh, and we uh, would encourage people who are, th who are seeing signs, indicators of this uh, amongst their community to come forward and share that information with us. They can do that uh, in a way that doesn't require me to sh pass that information on to other policing or immigration authorities, for example. Our concern is for the well-being of the people involved, particularly where there are children involved. Our human rights obligations are to place the interests of the child at the top of the list of things we consider and the breakdown of marriages, particularly where there are children involved, can often uh, leave lifelong scars. Yeah, right. And there's family protection issues that are involved here to ensure that children uh, and the partners in the marriage are, are, uh, are looked after and that their well-being is protected. Uh, it can be very difficult for uh, people in uh, forced marriages, usually women and girls, but not only in this country, it uh, can be very difficult for them to come forward and they can feel very isolated. Mm -hmm. I've had survivors of those situations speak with me in the yep. last six months and tell me explicitly that they felt that they were confronted with an impossible choice between either being homeless or staying with a roof over their head but continued abuse and exploitation. Uh, this is a story you hear not only by no means only mm. in, uh, in culturally and linguistically diverse communities, but across the Australian population, that there are women in particular uh, suffering a domestic and family violence and abuse of one form or another who feel they can't get that support. And I think what we see now is an awakening uh, across the community to the need for us to do more to help them find safe pathways into alternative social housing. Uh, into the kinds of financial and psychological support that they they need. Yep. In, in this state, in New South Wales, we have important schemes and arrangements in place to help people with those kinds of arrangements uh, through the Victims' Rights and Support Scheme, uh, for example, and through a range of state government and non-government uh, organisations that can provide that kind of support. So if people are watching or listening are concerned that they or someone they know might be in that situation, I'd strongly encourage them to contact 1-800-RESPECT uh, or alternatively to contact, if they feel that this that them, uh, might be relevant, the Australian Federal Police uh, or indeed the New South Wales Police. And if that is not an option they want to pursue, they're also welcome to contact us uh, at the uh, Office of Anti-Slavery mm -hmm. Commissioner. That doesn't mean that people have to feel that they themselves or the case they're looking at is a slavery case. In New South Wales, you may know we have a no wrong door policy. So if someone presents with concerns and needs assistance, there's no wrong door. We'll make sure they get the, ass the assistance mm -hmm. and support that they need to resolve their problems. Yes, yeah. Well, uh, we have heard a lot about uh, child labor, for example, in and uh, <clears throat> a lot of products which uh, we see on the shelves in the supermarket may be coming from some of those countries. How do you tackle those issues? I'm really excited about what's going on in New South Wales in this regard. So we're the first state, the first jurisdiction anywhere in the world to require government entities as a matter of law not to buy those goods and services. And uh, we have new arrangements in place that are going to lead to reporting by over 400 government departments, local councils, 
uh, and other public organizations. Together, they buy about $35 billion worth of goods uh, in the Australian market, and many of those are goods and services that are imported from overseas, some of which uh, will have uh, components from South Asia and across uh, Asia more broadly. Um, there are important uh, uh, arrangements now being put in place that allow buyers here in New South Wales to work with suppliers, uh, including in foreign countries, to ensure those suppliers can keep selling their products mm. to us here in New South Wales, but producing those products in a way that doesn't require modern slavery. Oh, okay. uh, we see important steps being taken, for example, in the European Union and in the United States to take a similar approach. And that can give us comfort that we're not acting alone here. We're not imposing um, an additional price on the consumer uh, or the taxpayer, indeed, uh, here in New South Wales. We're actually part of a larger group of countries that is now taking steps to ensure that the products and services we're buying are not coming at the expense of uh, the people who are, who are making them. Is your finding enforceable or would you go to an enfor enfor enforceable agency like the police or the court? So we, we do have some powers there actually, which we're just uh, developing at the moment, um, including the ability to publish a list of entities that are not uh, undertaking the steps that I've just outlined to ensure they're not uh, buying products of modern slavery. We, we anticipate that that list will go live a little later in, this, in the year. Perhaps more important than that though is the way that this uh, program of change is going to lead to all of the different buyers uh, working together to make sure that collectively they're exercising leverage along the supply chain to improve the products, uh, the, the production and distribution practices in that supply chain. So it's not just a name and shame approach, it's also about offering positive incentives, carrots, not just sticks, yeah. to suppliers to encourage them uh, to see value in producing these goods and services in a more sustainable and humane way. Mm. Commissioner, you mentioned that uh, only 20% of these cases are reported and uh, would you like to give a call to uh, the US of our program, how those victims can approach you? As you said that uh, domestic violence uh, uh, number uh, is one, and also you said the AFP is another uh, place they can go to. Uh, would you like to give those, our viewers a call finally? Absolutely. If you're concerned that you or someone you know is suffering abuse and exploitation and you want to get them help, you can contact us at antislavery at justice.nsw.gov.au. Your communication with us can be confidential. We don't have to pass that information on to the police, the immigration authorities or anybody else unless a child is at significant risk of harm and we'll do everything we can to make sure you get the advice, support and assistance that you need. No one should be living in modern slavery in Australia. Please come forward and let us provide you the support and assistance you deserve. Anti-slavery commissioner, Dr. James Cocaine, thanks very much for finding time to talk to Aussie Indian today.